We're slowly getting back to normal with the choir singing again. That's good. History repeating itself with that timeline series we're looking at and studying through the sermons. Number two. Check, check, one, two. Brought it down, that's good. Okay, this is the one that I did, I was going to do right before the hurricane hit, didn't get a chance to do it, so I did it at the feast. I'm gonna do it again. I guess I can do it one more time. Because we've been kind of busy around here with all the work going on, and I didn't have really time to get one together. Changed a couple of things in it, but uh, I talked about fear. Let me go back to uh, the Great Depression area where Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave his inauguration. I'm gonna talk about that. The first inauguration of Franklin D. Roosevelt as the 32nd President of the United States was held on Saturday, March 4th, 1933 uh, at the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. It was the 37th inauguration marked the commencement of the first term of him of the President Roosevelt as president and John Nance Garner as vice president. It took place in the wake of Democrat Roosevelt's landslide victory over Republican incumbent Herbert Hoover in the 1932 presidential election. With the nation at its peak of the Great Depression, Roosevelt's inaugural speech was awaited with great anticipation. Broadcast nationwide on several radio networks the speech was heard by tens of millions of Americans and set the stage for Roosevelt's urgent efforts to respond to the crisis. And we're going through a crisis now in which we need our leaders to give us some encouragement, but this is what he went through. Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes administered the presidential oath of office. Roosevelt wore at that time a morning coat, striped trousers for the inauguration took the oath with his hand on the family, his family Bible, and it was open to 1 Corinthians 13. That Bible was published in 1686 in Dutch. It remains the oldest Bible ever used in an inaugural ceremony, as well as the only one not in English, and was originally used by Roosevelt for his 1929 and 1931 inaugurations as governor of New York, and later his three sub subsequent presidential inaugurations until his death in 1945. Roosevelt proceeded to deliver his 1800 word, approximately 20 minute long inaugural address, best known for his famously pointed reference to fear itself. I think everybody remembers that quote. He says, it's in the beginning of it, quote, I am certain that my fellow Americans, he goes on, that my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with the candor and the decision which the present situation of our nation impels. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly, honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured and will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advancement. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and of vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory, and I am convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. Now in talking about the causes of the economic crisis and its moral dimensions, Roosevelt placed blame squarely on the greed and short-sightedness of bankers and businessmen. Quote, rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, have admitted their failure and have abdicated. In other words, they washed their hands of it at that time after they admitted it. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. 
The money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truths. The wording is pretty cool. The measure of the restoration lies in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit, he says. Recognition of the falsity false, false, of material wealth as the standard of success goes hand in hand with the abandonment of the false belief that public office and high political position are to be valued only by the standards of pride of place and personal profit. And there must be an end to a conduct in banking and in business which too often is given to a sacred trust, the likeness of callous and selfish wrongdoing. Sounds familiar today, don't it? Restoration calls, however, not for changes in ethics alone. This nation is asking for action and action now. As the speech continued, Roosevelt then turned to the dawning issue of unemployment, which had reached a staggering 25% when he assumed office. Quote, the withered leaves of industrial enterprise lie on every side. Farmers find no markets for their produce. The savings of many years and thousands of families are gone. More important, a host of unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence and an equally great number of toil with little return. He says, only a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it wisely and courageously. There are many ways in which it can be helped, but it can never be helped merely by talking about it. We must act and act quickly, unquote. After touching briefly on foreign relations, the policy of good neighbor, quote, the neighbor who resolutely respects himself and because he does so, he also respects the rights of others, unquote. Roosevelt turned again to the economic crisis, assuring his countrymen that he would act swiftly and with determination. Finally, he says, I am prepared under my constitutional duty to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. These measures or such other measures as the Congress may build out of its experience and wisdom, I shall seek within my constitutional authority to bring to speedy adoption. But in the event that the Congress shall fail to take one of these two courses, and in the event that the national emergency is still critical, he says, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. He says, I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. Those words were bold and they needed to hear that back in the midst of the Great Depression. After that inaugural address, a woman by the name of Sarah Love said, quote, any man who could talk like that in times like these is worthy of every ounce of support a true American has, unquote. Her quote is reflective of the popular sentiment felt for Roosevelt's dynamic, confident, and inspiring oratory, his speech. Close aide Raymond Moley was responsible for crafting that speech, as did many of Roosevelt's speech, speeches. So the credit goes to a man by the name of Raymond Moley. The idea of lightening Roosevelt's coming task to commanding a war effort originated from that man. The day after his inauguration, Roosevelt assembled a special session of Congress to declare a four-day bank holiday, and on March 9th, signed the Emergency Banking Act, which provided a mechanism for reopening, rather, reopening. He continued on for what became his first 100 days of the New Deal. Tom Kerry talks about that when he talks about the Green Deal, the new Green Deal that's coming in 2030. The parallel significance of that time period is what we're heading into again today. And we need a leader like that, again, to speak, speak to us and speak to the American people in such a way. When he talked about we have nothing to fear but fear itself, that quote right there I pondered a lot about and was wondering what he meant by that. So I looked up the word fear, and it says fear 
is an emotion induced by perceived danger or threat, of course we know that, which causes physiological changes and ultimately behavioral changes such as fleeing, hiding, or freezing from perceived traumatic events. Fear may occur in response to a certain stimulus occurring in the present or in anticipation or expectation of a future threat perceived as a risk to oneself. The fear response arises from the perception of danger leading to confrontation with or escape from avoiding the threat, also known as fight or flight response, which in extreme cases of fear, like horror or terror, can be a freeze response or paralysis. Fear is modulated by the process of cognition or intellectual awareness that we have around us and your learning. Thus, fear is judged as rational or appropriate and irrational or inappropriate, both ways. An irrational fear is called a phobia, like fear of closed spaces and elevators and stuff like that and heights. Fear is closely related to the emotion anxiety which occurs as a result of threats that are perceived to be uncontrollable or unavoidable. Research also suggests that individuals' fears are not solely dependent on their nature, but are also shaped by their social relations and culture, which guide their understanding of when and how much fear to feel. In other words, let's just say for an example, it may not be true that Tom's afraid of heights, which I think he is afraid of heights but I'm not afraid of heights. I have a fear of public speaking. Tom doesn't have a fear of public speaking. So there's a difference in everybody and everybody's different in that respect. So the measure of fear is different in everybody. Again, it says, quote, fears are not solely dependent on a person's nature, but are also shaped by their social relations and their culture around them, which guide their understanding of when and how much fear to feel. Quote, fear helps us learn empathy and protects us from danger. But fearlessness, research suggests, is linked to lack of morality and hence to violent and criminal behavior. Fear helps protect us. It makes us alert to danger and prepares us to deal with it. Feeling afraid is very natural and it's helpful in some situations. It can be like a warning signal that cautions us to be careful. Like all emotions, fear can be mild, it can be medium, or it can be very, very intense, unquote. So what we, as a true people of God, are soon to see all around the world in the coming years, perhaps even months, we know in the coming years, will be other human beings reacting to, quote, end time events, which will go beyond that fear, an intense fear. But half the battle we know in our measure of fear is just knowing what to expect, which is what we study through Bible prophecy. And we use Matthew 24 as an outline of the things we see around us that the world doesn't really watch for, but like Christ said, we would hear rumors of wars and wars, and of course see and live through wars that we've done, verses six and seven. He talks about nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom in Matthew 24. He talks about the famines or the food shortages and the food crisis that we'll be seeing in the near future. The pestilences or the plagues, the epidemics, the viruses, the unseen enemy. Earthquakes, seismic activity, underground eruptions, volcanic activity. The blood, sweat, tears, and cries from all of this is written as just the beginning of sorrows. He says that in verse 8. Many more events will bring many more tears, many more cries, and most of all, tremendous fear in men. We are seeing and will see much more persecution of Christians in verse 9 all over the world. The world doesn't watch for what we watch, and they, don't, they won't even believe it until it's hit them head on. And then that fear will hit them suddenly. Most of God's people will not be surprised when certain things happen due to our understanding of God's words and his prophecies. Because you know and walk daily with Jesus Christ of Nazareth, from the mere mention of his name, you will be hated, put down, and belittled from that persecution, verse 10. Even within the church of God community itself, people will be offended by your strong faith when they compare it to their own. They will forget that they're not supposed to judge another or have a respect for persons, quote unquote. And they will compare one with another without checking their human nature. 
their worldly quote unquote man that they put to death in baptism will reemerge through human nature. The spirit of hatred will surround us all. There's a quote that I saw on Facebook that says, ships don't sink because of the water around them. Ships sink because of the water that gets in them. Don't let what's going on around you get inside you and weigh you down. That's the, end of the meaning of that. Quote, false prophets, unquote, will be everywhere. Even with those who have that truth inside of them, those Jesus Christ, they will add little drops of lies to falsify what they're talking about in verse 11 and 12. And as many as we already have like this in the world, it's amazing that we'll see an increase in these people. They will seem like, quote, angels of light. They will seem like they really know what they're talking about. But God's true people will have that gut feeling that something just ain't right. We know that even with our loved ones is that it's not an enemy that will betray you simply because they're an enemy. It's not in their vocabulary. Betrayal comes from someone close to us, like a friend or a loved one. Even the nation has their allies that will betray them. Prove all things will come to mind that we have to live by in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, it talks about. Lawlessness will continue to take over and replace love and kindness and compassion, verse 12. Yet the commission of preaching a warning message and teaching God's law to his church will continue. That's amazing. Even with all that thing, all these things that are going on, we will still be talking about God's word and teaching people his law. We will hold on to God's word that instructs us to watch and monitor the situations all around the world. That word monitor means to observe and check the progress or quality of something over a period of time. Keep on the systematic review. We can see the stage getting set up for prophecy yet to happen. We will reflect on our many, many notes concerning events like the abomination of desolation, which is for an example. And Christ gave us in verse 15 that specific prophet to look into, that prophet Daniel. He also said in verse 21 that there's going to be no time like it. You can go through all your history books, all your encyclopedias, and find all the very worst events that this world has been through and multiply that by a thousand. That's what's coming upon us. I'm wondering if they will develop a greater storm than a Category 5, which is all we've seen. What's beyond a Category 5? Goodness, we don't want to know that. There's a TV show on the History Channel that came on a while back. It was called Earth After Humans. And it talked about day one and day two and day 15 and years down the road where there was no humans on Earth and how the Earth actually healed itself and actually took over. The buildings and everything you saw around, they had the leaves and the grass and the trees growing through them. There was no humans around at all, but the Earth kept growing. Imagine the world on fire and over eight billion people completely gone. All the people on Earth dead. No humans on Earth. It can happen and it will happen unless a miracle happens. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is that miracle and only because of you. Verse 22 it says, and except those days should be shortened, he says there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. You are what's protecting this entire world. Brace yourselves for the end, but the end is not yet. As we continue to watch the news of world events and continue in our study of God's word, our perspective of God's timeline will become clearer and clearer. In Matthew 24, verse 13, Jesus Christ of Nazareth revealed to his disciples, which is us as well, a very important aspect of 6,000 years of prophecy. He says, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Endure what? Endure who and what around us? And definition of endure says to hold out against, sustain without yielding, undergo, to support adverse force or influence of any kind, suffer without yielding, suffer patiently. 
Obeying God's laws are a lifetime work of endurance. Our resistance to the world and society around us is also a work of endurance. And here comes another year of everything Christmas that we will have to endure again. On the radio stations, the TV commercials, that will be surrounded by us. Confirming the world events that Christ detailed in the many prophecies is evident today. And we can see some of the future events that will happen because of this world's heart condition. This world, mainly America, has an identity crisis in so many ways and aspects. In verse 4, he says, take heed. There are multiple scriptures that have that same word and quote, heed, take heed. In this verse, the Greek word number is 991. It's, it means to look at, literally or figuratively. Behold, beware, perceive, regard, see it. When I looked it up, it also tells us to compare with the Greek word of 3700, which means to gaze, that is, with wide open eyes, as at something remarkable, an earnest but more continued inspection. And number 4648 means a watching from a distance to consider something. In the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, or the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Greek word number there is 4337. From the root word number 4314 and 2192, it means to hold the mind towards, that is, pay attention to, be cautious about, apply oneself to, adhere to, attendance, beware, be given to, give and have regard to it. Earlier in verse 6, as he began to speak his warning, he tells us, see that you be not troubled in all these things that he's telling us. The conflicts in the Middle East are at certain times being broadcast on what seems like on a daily basis, depending on the time of year. And I admit, I can't help but feel a little troubled when I see some of the things that's going on over there. And then I, quote unquote, take heed and consider as we watch from a distance. I think about the history of the world wars and how even the civil wars had front lines on a map. And it had a lot to do with territory occupation. They used to have flags and uniforms and they knew who to kill in these wars. With terrorists, of course, there are no front lines on a map, no uniforms, etc. And it has more so to do with religion cultures and ideologies than a territory occupation. Then when all is thought about, a speculation comes to my mind in that ticking time bomb scenario. 76 years ago on August 9th, 1945, that atomic bomb was dropped. World War II ended and the United Nations was born. It is not a coincidence that within that same time period you can draw a parallel timeline of events, an important fact that happened. And Tom discovered this also in his timeline series. The Worldwide Church of God, founded by the late Herbert E. Armstrong, later his son, the late Mr. Groner Ted Armstrong, expounded the God, the God's law even deeper of the basic truths of God. This church's heritage and roots come from that specific church and its doctrines. We are its remnants, so to speak. Watching the Middle East out of the control today, I think about that nuclear capabilities that Iran has and Pakistan has. I cannot lie to myself and say that I am not just a little troubled about how fragile that area is surrounding Jerusalem. World War III, will it start in the same way that World War II ended? Could it begin with a catastrophic nuclear bomb? I have no idea, and neither do we. But like all of us do, when we are troubled about something as frightening as World War III, we watch, we pray, and we monitor. Personally, I still get comfort and strength at the very moment of prayer, and then God has his way of helping me to remember certain scriptures that are needed depending on that subject matter that I'm worried about. Of course, we can't remember something that we haven't first read about. So that's why we need to keep reading the Bible over and over and over again. Turn to Romans 15. Some of us are stronger than others, physically, mentally, and spiritually. 
Physically speaking, there are certain physical objects that weigh too much for me to pick up and handle. Mentally speaking, there are people that will faint in the sight of blood. And on a spiritual level, even our gift of God's Holy Spirit is granted to each one of us in measure only, not all at once. In other words, if Tom cannot climb a tall ladder because of that fear of heights, then what makes sense would be for him to stay on the ground, hold the ladder, and I'll climb up that ladder because I'm not afraid of the heights, working together on it. But fear also has a measure. If you're at the bottom of a tall tree and there's a big bear coming toward you, then your fear of getting eaten by that bear will rob your fear of heights. You're going to climb that tree. In Romans 15, Paul wrote, verse 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproach of them that reproach you fell on me. And I like verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may be, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. When I think about the character of the men, women, prophets, and kings written in the Bible, I try to take heed there also and consider. I think about how God dealt with them and what they went through in their lives. We know that most of them did not want to do the work that God laid out before them. Sometimes, because of our lack of knowledge and understanding, we say to ourselves, nah, I could have done that better. Back then, nah, I wouldn't have run away from God like Jonah did. That would be lying to ourselves. That'd be a little bit arrogant. Moses, Isaiah, et cetera, and many others we read about tried to tell God they couldn't do it. Jesus Christ of Nazareth himself prayed privately the night that he was betrayed. Three times he was on his knees praying to his father that if there was any other way quote, to take this cup from me, unquote. Jesus Christ, he knew pain. He also knew grief. We real he realized and totally understood exactly what suffering he was about to have to endure. When it comes to our knowledge of God's truth, we understand who our choice is when it comes to our human trials and troubles. We know that Christ was 100% human, just like us. And we also know that Satan was never human. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All the stories are amazing, beginning with Adam, who lived at the age of 930. That's a long time. I can't imagine the emotions and the thoughts that his mind was struggling with as he watched many generations die around him as he grew older. Jesus Christ, Adam's creator, must have talked to him with compassion many, many, many times. Today, with us, that exact same comfort from Jesus Christ is constantly helping us on a day-by-day -day basis. All of us are very familiar with Paul's beautiful words in what we call the love chapter in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, which is the same chapter that Roosevelt's Bible was open to in his inauguration. In the previous chapter, Chapter 12, Paul explains the many diversities of gifts granted to everyone in God's church. We see it a lot in the Bible, but the human body is used again as a perfect analogy. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, breaking into the middle, Paul writes, But all these works that one and self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, which is a measure. For as a body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, and have been all made to drink into that one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Down at verse 18, but now has God set those members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased them. Verse 23, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncommonly parts have more abundant commonness. 
for our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacks the lowest. That there should be no schism, no split, gap, or division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Notice verse 26, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Isaiah 57, verse 1, God says, The righteous perish, and no man lays it to heart. No one, one considers it. No one thinks deeper about it. And merciful men, it says, are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. God will allow people to die due to the evil to come. He is a merciful God. There are many, many people we know who are alive and well today that we also know would not be able to handle certain evil events that are prophesied to come on this nation. We, as God's people, we worry about them and we pray for these individuals. After God's church was started on the day of Pentecost in 31 AD, and God the Father's Holy Spirit became available through Jesus Christ, at that time Satan knew he was a sitting duck, what God's people had to endure intensified. Fear was justified back then. Satan's madness intensified. Another great example is the Apostle Paul and his endurance. He too gave us reminders of Abraham. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says, and so after he, Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise, speaking of the physical nation of Israel, Hebrews 6:15. Though his, through his son Isaac and then Jacob. In Hebrews 10, in speaking to us, Paul says, verse 32, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were eliminate, illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. He says in th verse 33, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. Just sit, say nothing, and it seems that bad things and persecution will come and find you. For you had compassion of me, verse 34, in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. He says, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. In other words, never give up. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. He says, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. But the end is not yet. Brace yourselves just for a little while longer. Stay in Hebrews and turn to chapter 12. He says, blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. And James said that in verse, chapter, verse 12 of chapter 1. It is impossible for God to lie to us or to anybody. It is impossible for him to lie, period, if you study Hebrews 6. In Hebrews 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, he says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. In verse 2, he says, Looking unto or consider Think about, believe, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. In other words, God had a plan long before the universe was created. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In verse 3, he says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, unless you be wearied and faint in your minds. Pain will wear you out. We all know a little bit about pain. How do we get endurance? How do we not get tired and just simply give up? How many more times will we will be asked to work on a Sabbath day by our bosses? How many of us look so strange to our friends, family, and other others and our family members for keeping the Passover season and not Easter? How about the Feast of Tabernacles instead of setting up that Christmas tree, the lights, the Santa Claus balloons, and everything else out front? Wouldn't it be easier to just go with the flow? Of course it would. 
make more money if we work 24-7? Of course it would. Turning to Hebrews 6, let's ask, who would be your God? Where would your learned knowledge of God's word go? Can a person lose knowledge? Hebrews 6, verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the, partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Thank God daily for keeping that thing, that creature that's growing inside of you, for retaining that knowledge you have learned so that he can reveal to you even more spiritual things, so that you can perceive that spiritual growth. Yet be careful because God's Holy Spirit inside of you, it can be quenched. We've given that, we've given that warning by Paul. And knowledge, it can be lost. God tells us to remember things like the Sabbath because sometimes we will forget. Words that we have understood in the Word of God will be transferred back to a worldly meaning. Words like hope, words like faith, words like belief. Our endurance depends on the true spiritual meanings of these words. Hebrews 11, verse 3, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are seen were not made by the things which do appear. This is called the faith chapter. Paul reminds us of the men and women chosen by God and how they endured. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, Paul wrote, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, not thinking beyond this world. The mind of Christ is not of this world. It's beyond this world. God called one man many years ago who was just like you and I in our calling and he had a family with whom he grew up with in Babylon the city of Ur or Ur later after God had changed his name to Abraham through faith also Sarah his wife verse 11 herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised it verse 12 therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. God has called us, and many more like us, out of this world, this Babylon, and has given us not only a promise, but even a down payment on that promise, God's Holy Spirit through his Son. Verse 13, these all died, he says, in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers, and they were, they were, they were pilgrims on the earth, he says. They embraced them, he says. Hold on to God's knowledge with all your might, because you can't lose it. I love the example somebody gave one time of washing dishes with all that soapy water of glasses crystal glasses in that soapy water and how fragile it became when you started messing around with it and how easy it was to break them. Before turning to Matthew 19 and Mark chapter 3, consider the man as well as the Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. As God of the Old Testament, did he ever get angry with mankind? Did he not punish his human creation with the flood? Later, as he built a nation for himself, God would use other nations as a strong arm against Israel. In Mark chapter 3, verse 1, he says, And he, Christ, entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, and that they might accuse him. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? They didn't say a word. Notice verse 5. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he says unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole, just like the other hand. Anger was grief. It is only God who knows the very heart, the intent, 
and the mind of human nature that's inside of us. God's heart's desire is for us to really, really understand him and his word. And then use that understanding to choose the right way of living over the wrong. God's commandments shows us who he is. And is it not good to know exactly who we're worshiping? I think it is. In Matthew 19, there is a good example of people who are in the world without the knowledge of God, yet they have a naturally righteous character. Verse 16 of chapter 19 in Matthew, it says, And behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus went on and started quoting the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt do no murder, not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and your mother, and thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. In verse 20, the young man said to him, All these things I've kept them from my youth. What do I still lack? Even people in this world with common sense know what's wrong or right in human laws. Russia, Japan, et cetera, all these nations around the world, they got stop signs, they got red lights, they know what's right and wrong. <laughs> Through knowledge and understanding and practice of God's way of living, we learn to endure whatever it is we're going through. I like this other quote that I saw. It says, God didn't remove the Red Sea, he parted it. Sometimes God doesn't remove your problems, he makes a way through them. We need to keep that in mind. Our faith level overrides our fear level year after year as we grow. His holy days of the seasonal harvest reminds us of this future that we're about to go through. Beginning with a world without Satan for 1,000 years on that seventh day. Imagine waking up one morning and just having one day without Satan's influence. Yeah. Matthew 19, verse 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou will be perfect, go and sell what thou has, and give, to, give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. Right then and there, he was given a chance to be his disciple. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, because he had all these great possessions. And then said Jesus to his disciples, Truly I say to you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, then who can be saved? Why were they amazed? Exceedingly amazed. You think they could see that this man was pretty much okay? Even though he was rich, he was still a good man. He probably was well established, known of many people. He gave to the poor because he afforded, he could afford them a lot more. On the opposite extreme, the poor in that area had little access to things. They coveted, they stole, they sinned, etc. In verse 26, but Jesus beheld them. He knew, of course, that Pentecost had not yet come. Their perception of things were different. It's like us living our lives without God's Holy Spirit. And he said to them, with men this is impossible, but with God all, all things are possible. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. You ever had someone cut you off in traffic? You ever have somebody break into the front of you in a line that you've been waiting in? Makes you feel a little angry. He says in verse 20, For what glory is it if, when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? What glory is it, in other words, when you make a mistake, a bad choice that you know is wrong, and then you're yelled at, looked down upon by others who will not forgive, and you take it patiently? He says, But if, when you do well and you suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Did not Christ say that we, as his people, following his example, would be hated by the entire world? Of course.
what's he did? First Peter 2, verse 21. For even, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judged righteously, who his, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, whose, by whose stripes you are healed. In these end times that we are seeing around us, it is not just the world events that your family and unconverted loved ones will be coming to you and question about. It will not be those, quote, I told you so situations, not by your words alone, but it will be by your continuous actions that they see and your well-doing, quote, unquote, by seeing the way of life that you're actually living. Some of these, the things that we go through, we can't really understand at the very moment we're going through them until later on. But later, after, or because we have endured those certain troubles, without forgetting God in the process, perhaps loved ones might notice much more than just your past words. It is impossible to compare ourselves to any endurance of suffering to that which Jesus Christ himself of Nazareth, he suffered and he endured. Sometimes we forget who else was watching our personal trials and our troubles that we were going through. We talk about how God, the Father of Christ, had to turn his back on his son the moment of his death on the tree. We talk about how Christ alone had to take on all the sins of the world upon himself and that this is the reason his father turned away. This is true. But consider a little further the mind of Christ and who he was as a man. Is there not emotion with God in his divine state of being? I mean, that's where emotion came from, and it was created by God. And what does mercy mean? Did not Christ say that he and his father are of the same mind? So that emotion of sorrow was there, too. Consider once again what sin feels like, like and consider what remorse feels like. Consider what shame feels like. And not just because we were caught doing something wrong, that's a false remorse. Not sorry that we got caught, but sorry that we actually went through the very act of thinking about it and sinning against someone or against God. That's called true repentance. Private tears were actually seen by God that we don't realize. Now consider now that Christ had never experienced such an emotion his entire life until all the world's sins were laid upon him. That brief time in all of his history that Christ felt something strange or foreign to him. That feeling that we have felt many, many times in our life. Jesus Christ of Nazareth never, ever had to repent of anything like we must do often. For an example, how bad did Judas feel afterwards? When that evil spirit is finished with his battle with you, it leaves you all alone with your guilty thoughts, fearful thoughts, some unfortunately through the mindset of suicide. And that's the cruelty of Satan the devil. As we brace ourselves for the end, we will talk to God in prayer more and more often. We will weep as humans just like Christ did. Today, many grown men who are military veterans, hardcore, manly men, as their anger mixed with sadness calms down, I have no doubt that tears follow, which begins with a deep, gut-wrenching, behind-the-eyes burning feeling that all of us have no doubt can relate to when they saw what was going on in Afghanistan after that 20-year battle. Nowadays, sometimes we will need to pray twice. A constant state of prayer, quote unquote, will soon be necessary. As we approach God the Father in private prayer, take a brief moment to think about who we are meditating through. Jesus Christ said that he did not know when his Father would finally turn to him and tell him it's time now. Christ is still patiently enduring the evil that he sees down in this world and around this world. Christ sees what you are going through every day. 
He knows what fear is, though I doubt seriously that he actually feared anything at all or anyone. In, in April of 2002, a year before his death, Garner Ted Armstrong did a sermon entitled The Culmination of Prophecy. At that time, he used the current events and he expounded on a list of prophetic insights. No doubt Mr. Armstrong already had a fantastic gift of memory recall, like a photographic memory. Yet, when you mix that gifted talent with his intelligence and knowledge of the Bible and add God's Holy Spirit to it, he was truly a man of God. At the end of that sermon, he laid out a list of what he felt God's people should watch for and look for as it pertains to biblical prophecy. Whether it be a headline news or, or some news that is important to us that the mainstream media doesn't always report, we still have to watch that. And we have already witnessed how quickly things can change for the worse. What we were told to look for and watch from GTA's list 19 years ago, some of those have developed into actual real-time statements. Tom used it in one of his sermons, I forgot which sermon it was, but it, it goes through a list of world time events to watch for. And it has, I think, 13 or 14 of them. The first one says, look for a charismatic Arab leader who will attempt to bring Arab nations under one green flag of Islam who will become the king of the south of prophecy. Now that the United States of America has surrendered in that 20-year war in the Middle East, the stage we saw has been set for the, and the players are getting in place. Now on this day, the ninth day of God's ninth month and the year of the Roman world 2021, we can absolutely state with almost 100% assurance that very, very soon, a popular, charismatic Arab leader will bring the Arab nations together under one green flag of Islam, the king of the south in prophecy. In this chain reaction of unfolding events, there will be the creation of a multinational, all-European army with incredible capabilities. Because in number two, he says, look for the creation of a multinational, all-European army, rapid deployment force capable of immediately launching an occupation of Palestine. He says at that time, 19 years ago, it's already being formed. We can put this down as almost a real life, real time statement. America can now no longer be trusted overseas. This European military force will be able to quickly and immediately launch an overwhelming occupation towards Palestine, where the area of all those troubles are increasing all the time. But wait. Because of the culture and religious principles of the entire Middle East area, Europe will need and it will have its own religious leader who will have all power and influence over the various peoples and cultures of the Europe and Asian continents, Russia, Japan, China, etc., who also practice in various spots Christian values, included of whom all of the other Western religions have their roots, the Protestants, Baptists, etc., and this, of course, is the prophecies concerning the Vatican and the Pope. His influence will be to help Judean Christians culture continue in their practice of their protected freedoms to worship. Due to the Jewish sect and the Palestinian area being surrounded by extreme enemies of the Islamic culture, they will first start to exercise their freedom of worship by a dedication ceremony. You will see them set up a temporary cornerstone near the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And this is number four when he talks about looking for a building temple or erection of a temporary structure for a dedication cornerstone. I think that'll be coming soon. Mm -hmm. Tensions will intensify among the 4,000 Islamic Muslims that are kneeling down inside the Islam Alaska Mosque near the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. The ongoing peace talks and negotiations that will fail. The Arabs make the first mistake, though, near Jerusalem and come close to Jerusalem's western wall that will be killing hundreds of civilians that are in prayer at that time. A small legal group from the Israeli military backed by the government of Europe, they will get approval to carry out the destruction of the Alaska Mosque Temple. On Israel's horizon towards the east, preparations by Iran and Pakistan began moving their combined Arab armies towards Jerusalem. 
You get my point. You can go back and look and get this list of things that go on to Ted Road back in 2003, 2002 rather, and go down in that list and change it around to where it's a current event. And you think about this. Over the past 20 years, since 9-11, 2001, the 19 terrorists that carried out the attack on American soil had families of their own with their own culture. Their children were taught the ways of their fathers and were indoctrinated with the Koran, their culture, and their gods. Today, their children, now the same age as their fathers, hold on to that same system of belief and thinking they are doing their good, their God, rather, a service by killing, quote, the great Satan of the West, which is us. Plus, their technology has advanced over that same 20 years of time. I've always kidded around and said, I wonder what the 20 years later of the technology is going to be, because 20 years ago, we didn't have the cell phones that we have today and how powerful that knowledge can be brought to us around the world. They have no fear of dying in the name of their God and people. They will be using chemical and biological weapons attacking our major water supplies, shutting down oil and gas pipelines, nuclear power plants. Shipping and distribution areas will be their points of interest along our coastlines and seaports. Their targets include the Pacific coast of California, the Atlantic coast of Virginia, north and south, the Gulf Coast of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, east and west. Major important cities such as Houston, Dallas, New Orleans, New York, et cetera, are on the priority radar. Seaports along the Mississippi River are on their list as well. Meanwhile, many places of worship will be giving way to certain rules and regulations within their state that have monitored their speeches and sermons and calling it hate speech. Many underground groups backed up by Antifa, BLM, et cetera, backed by local leaders, backed by unnamed federal officials go on the attack, burning churches, carrying out fake riots in order to disrupt our freedoms, such as speech, quote unquote. The Islamic Arab oil rich nations now have full control of the world's oil production. Their diplomatic power over the entire Middle East countries will exercise trade wars as the king of the south refuses to increase oil production. I wrote this a while back, but now we see on television the news of America begging for the OPEC nations to bring up their oil supply. Shipping and oil containers will have to be surrounded by military protection in places like the Suez Canal near Jordan, the Red Sea south towards Ethiopia, the port of Babel Ahmad at the southern Red Sea and the Arabian Sea, east toward the United Arab Emirates, the Gulf near Iraq and Iran, the Strait of Hermaz. This occupation will cause the beast power of Europe to also take action with military occupation of those and other ports in order to secure all the sources of oil. Revelation chapter 6, the seven seals are mentioned, verse 5 and 6 come to my mind. It says, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Treaty agreements and peace talks will continue to fail. Many battle skirmishes between the Palestinian Arabs and the Israeli military will cause yet another evasion by the power of the beast of Europe and their underlying mission to occupy Israel as their enemy. The king of the north will disguise it as a peacekeeping gesture in order to safeguard the remaining Jewish population of that area. COVID-19, that China virus, or whatever name you want to give it tomorrow, has become the new norm. It is here to stay as a very powerful, different strain of the flu. And this virus was man-made with the potential to become another biological weapon for China. But they screwed up, and it presented itself on the world stage way ahead of its time. Earthquakes will bring brief pauses to the wars and the chaos that seem nonstop. Distress, distressed countries pause briefly in their troubles so that they can look for survivors in those quakes and those floods and other natural disasters. disasters. Alongside the gunfires and various bombings are hundreds of aftershocks that mix in with the city streets echoes. 
America the beautiful is not so beautiful anymore and it has downsized into a third rate nation. North Korea will invade South Korea without a fight because America shows no interest because too much chaos on the home front is going on. Taiwan belongs to China once again and we see that on the headlines lately too. Vietnam and the Philippines will become subject to North Korea as well. The natural disasters will intensify. Changing weather patterns will become subject to gravitational pull of the moon and ocean tides. The meteor showers from time to time and more and more often will grab hold of those orbiting space trash of outdated satellites around our world, out in space. Finally, one early Sabbath morning, you approach the door and see a Jefferson Parish cop SUV parked in the back facing the front. And posted with very heavy tape, there's an official parish order subtitled at the top from the state of Louisiana with a brief single page letter with a heading from the federal government. As you begin to read it, there's a, comp there's a compliance number at the top of it and a short explanation of the newly imposed law. Above that, it will be entitled to, quote, Church of God Ministries International, God's Unchanging Word and in association with the News Nuggets and Insights Program, unquote, its website addresses, etc. And on it, you will read the phrase, cease and desist with allegedly illegal activity at this group's address. It is a first time warning of impending judicial enforcement under federal law in which the state and local law enforcement are subject to. Their evidence includes a copy of our statement of beliefs, a photocopy of our tax exempt status modified compliance numbers with the headers of a, the federal abortion law, the list of gay rights and LGBTQ programs throughout the city and state. The times we have been talking about for years are here. We are in the middle of the beginning of the end. These end time prophecies that we've been talking about, that we have been warning about to as many people as we can, are now becoming current events. The times we are in are frightening, to say the least. And the days are ahead, they're even more frightening. In our belief of what God says, we know from scripture that things are about to become so bad that, quote, men will seek death. It says, and in those days, quote unquote, shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Why? That's in Revelation 9, 6. According to the truth of God, there will be a second resurrection. So if someone cannot handle the evil events they see all around them, their desire will be to simply end it all. They don't want to see it anymore. Unfortunately, not only is suicide an incredible sin against God and family, but as soon as you die, you will be resurrected back to life in the second resurrection. And this is why our goal is the first resurrection. Why live as a human all over again? The stats on America's suicide rate are going up year after year after year, especially during the year 2020. And what's sad to me is reading about how young these individuals are and what exactly goes into the minds of these small children to the point of suicide. The point is that things will get that bad and we need to warn and prepare for it. The time is coming when there is no more time. The ticking clock has run out, Revelation 22 says in verse 8, and I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. And then said he to me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. He says, Worship God. And he said to me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand, he said, right now. In verse 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Finally, we cannot help and encourage others without first making sure that we ourselves are okay. And understanding what exactly we need to do when all hell breaks loose, quote unquote, 
is the only way we can help others understand exactly what they are witnessing. Thus, or therefore, that biblical principle in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3, he says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in your brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in your own eye? He says in verse 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to cast out the mote which is in your brother's eye. And to rephrase it without the chastisement of the instruction for us, in verse 3, in other words, quote, When you behold the mote, that trouble, that worry, that fear in your brother's eye, make sure you consider that beam, understand, in other words, that worry, that fear that you once felt. In verse 5, and not to call ourselves hypocrites, but first cast out the beam that of our own eye. In other words, make sure we are okay first and make sure we understand. And then we shall see clearly how to proceed and how to help someone else. Because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but has given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Pray always. Thank you.